warm-up review of bond enthalpies. Here we go. So we have two elements, X and Z, reacting with oxygen, forming XO3 and ZO3, respectively, according to these reactions. So as you can see, they gave you delta H's for both as well. So which bond is stronger? Is it the XO bond or the ZO bond? Explain. Anyone have any ideas here? Which one's stronger, XO or ZO? Anybody else want to weigh in? All right, yes, this would be correct. This one, the ZO, happens to be the stronger bond. Now can we explain why? How do we know this? We're focusing on bond enthalpies. Remember, there are multiple ways to calculate delta H. We can use Hess's law, we can use formations, we can use the bond enthalpies, multiple ways. We're using bond enthalpies, what does that entail? What equation are we looking at? Calculating that. Yes, the sum, oops, terrible, terrible E there. I can't write the sigmas very well, but okay, we'll try again. Sum of the bonds broken, broken, and this is bond energies, of course. Those bond enthalpies or energies minus the sum of the bonds formed, bond energies formed, Okay, so we need to really look at and evaluate this equation. Definitely have to memorize this one. This is the one that is not on the formula sheet. So we need to have this one um, in our heads and, and know it pretty well. They love to ask bond enthalpy stuff. So definitely make sure that you understand this equation fully. Looking here, since both of these individual elements are reacting with oxygen, the oxygen bond is a double bond because it's diatomic oxygen here. And each one of them have three of those oxygen bonds that have to break. Okay, so basically, what are we getting here in terms of uh, the bond breaking part? This part is the same, okay, for both reactions. Because the bonds that are going to break here are the, uh, the O2 bonds, and it's the same amount of energy, three times that double bond breaking. Over here, though, bond energy is formed. What's being formed? Well, this is going to be like X to O to O. So three of those, this would be Z to O to O, like so. So, and there's, you know, two times that because of the two here. So we'd have really six bonds for each that would be uh, being formed there. So this part is not the same, okay? And since this one has the higher negative value when you're subtracting the bonds formed, getting a negative, higher negative value means this value must be higher. So the bonds formed of the ZO must be at a higher numerical value than the bonds formed for the XO. So really manipulating the equation to explain it. Seen this one before on AP exams, on AP type questions. So the ZO is the stronger bond because it has the higher bond enthalpy. By definition, the stronger bond is going to have the higher, um, higher number numerical magnitude. The bond enthalpy being broken are equal for both reactions, but the bonds form must be higher for ZO to get the larger negative value for the delta H when subtracting using the equation. So you must reference the equation, okay? So um, you must, you know, tell that this is what you're looking at here. We're talking about the bonds being broken, that's the same, but the bonds being formed, that's different. The ZO value must be higher in order to achieve that negative 842 uh, for the delta H difference being higher. So that ZO, the subtracting the larger number there, is what we're going for. Learning targets, we're going to be looking at energy uh, changes again. 
That's pretty much what this entire unit's about. Calculating heat to warm, cool, and phase change. We're going to be looking at heating and cooling curves, explaining thermal equilibrium. Calculating any of the variables in Q equals MCAT or Q equals NCAT, which is really just the mole form of the equation. Explain the law of conservation of energy, heat gained and heat loss. It's still the same idea of the flowing into and out of the system. The law of conservation of energy and the first law of thermodynamics. Calculating molar enthalpy changes from calorimetry data. And we're also going to use, uh, which is, is going to be the heat divided by the mole in order to get the delta H's from the calorimetry data. That's what we're going to be using there to get that. And then we'll be looking at heat of solution, molar heat of solution, combustion, and neutralization, because those are different ways that the calorimetry data is collected, either, either dissolving something in solution, combusting it in a bomb calorimeter, or neutralizing using like acid-base type reactions. So heat capacity. When a system absorbs heat, its temperature increases. To increase, uh, the increase in temperature is directly proportional to the amount of heat absorbed. And this is going to give us the proportionality constant called the heat capacity. Also uses the variable C. The units of heat capacity are either joules per degree Celsius or joules per um, Kelvin. You could use kilojoules as well, of course, any of the prefixes there. Sometimes, you know, you might see calories per something, and that's if you're using the English unit. Heat capacity times the temperature change is going to give you the, the heat of that particular system there. The larger the heat capacity of the object being studied, the smaller the temperature will rise before um, for the given amount of heat. So things with high heat capacities versus things with low heat capacities. And really in a lot of this, we're talking about uh, warming things. If you're warming it up, if I'm cooking pasta and I have to put a pot of water on the stove to heat that um, and hopefully eventually get it to a boil. But that warming process where I'm adding heat there, of course, the temperature is going to increase for the water, but it'll take a while because water happens to be one of the ones that has a very high heat capacity. Metal is going to be uh, a very low heat capacity because it changes temperature pretty quickly. It conducts heat very well, so it absorbs it pretty quickly and, and the temperature goes up a lot. So here, if you're looking at this, this is just the heat. This is the heat capacity. This is the temperature change. So say I start with a thing of water on the stove and it's, you know, coming out of the faucet, it's probably pretty cool. So let's go with, I don't know if it would be that cold, but let's say like five degrees Celsius would be the TI. And then of course I'm warming it up and warming it up and um, trying to get it to a boil, but say I only warm it up for five minutes. So it ends up at 65 degrees. That would be the temperature change, would be uh, 60 degrees. And the heat capacity of water, you would multiply it by, and that would be how much heat was being absorbed by the water in that warming process. So that was that's what it's talking about. Now, we usually rarely use this because uh, we really want to check out the amounts there. Okay? So... Because the factors that affect heat capacity, one of them is the amount of the matter. Like if I only heat up 5 grams versus 5,000 grams, that's going to be a totally different amount of heat. We know heat is extensive and it's amount dependent. So uh, amount of matter is, is, uh, is key here. And we usually measure it by mass. That's why, why we do that is because in the lab our balances, of course, measure in grams. Uh, we don't really have balances that measure in moles. There's no, no, no tool to do it that way. Because moles is a counting unit, it really isn't um, a mass unit. So 200 grams of water requires twice as much heat to raise its temperature by 1 degree than does 100 grams of water. So the amount does matter here. Also the type of material. 
the type of material. Each material has its own specific heat, own heat capacity. So a thousand joules of heat will raise the temperature of 100 grams of sand, 12 degrees. Definitely has a lower heat capacity than water. But uh, a thousand joules, again, to raise the temperature of 100 grams of water would only be 2.4 degrees because water has the higher heat capacity. So keep that in mind. All right, specific heat. The measure of a substance intrinsic ability to absorb heat. I guess this didn't cross out here, so let's ignore that part, okay? All right. So we're looking here once again, defining it by mass. The specific heat capacity amount required to raise the temperature of one gram, one degree Celsius. This is an intensive property. So, cause we're referring to one gram, one degree Celsius, that measurable amount of heat in there. As you can see, liquid water is the highest at 4.184 ice because they are in different phases, they have different specific heats. Um, ice is 2.03 and steam or water vapor is 2.01. Still, these are pretty high. Ethanols, liquid ethanol um, is very high when they say grain alcohol is a very high percentage of alcohol. But if you look down here at some of the metals, aluminum, iron, lead, silver, gold, they are all especially lead and gold are very low. Their um, specific heats are quite small. So they heat up very quickly. Um, and so if I'm heating like a, an iron skillet and then, you know, a, a, an iron pot with water in it, if I heat it up for just a minute, I won't be able to touch the iron skillet in the center, but I could still probably put my finger in the water and would, it wouldn't even be close to being hot at that point. So the water is going to absorb a whole lot more heat before it changes its temperature, but that iron will like heat up almost instantly. The variables used for specific heat are usually C, that's the one I use, but you might see it written as CP or CS with the little subscripts representing specific heat. The units, usually the one that we use the most is joules per gram degree Celsius, because once again, we're measuring with mass. And in the lab, our thermometers and temperature probes measure in degrees Celsius. So that's the normal one. However, you, will, you could use, you know, you could do joules per grams times Kelvin. In the problem, if it gives it to you in Kelvin, it's just on the Kelvin scale. The only difference between the Kelvin scale and the Celsius scale is 273. So they are the same incremental magnitude. It just would be, you know, uh, the difference would be where your starting point is. So, all right. Water can absorb a lot of heat with a large increase in specific heat capacity. Uh, or without a large temperature increase due to the heat capacity. This is because of that 4.184, very high number here, does absorb lots of energy before it changes temperature. And that's why living by oceans and living on the coast, you get a little bit more of a mild climate than you would if you were inland at that same latitude. Same thing too. It's going to release a lot of energy before it changes its temperature. So this is why the um, living by the coast, you get more mild at that particular latitude. So in San Sacramento versus San Francisco, which are about the same you know, latitude, the coastal city uh, may be you know, 18 degrees different than the Sacramento, which would swing up and down, you know, from the night to the day in terms of the temperature change because the water wouldn't be there to moderate it. The water is going to absorb and, and uh, release the energy moderating the temperatures on the coast. So uh, it's very nice to um, have that. We do live near a body of water too on the Atlantic Ocean over here. And so we're not too far inland from it, but um, you go in a lot more inland, they're going to have more swings in their temperatures than we would normally. 
Another application of water, it's used as a coolant, especially in cars and other machines where it will be able to absorb a lot of the heat so that obviously we wouldn't want those mechanical parts to overheat and degrade. Well, when it's being cooled, yes, it's going to release heat, but it's not gonna change its temperature very fast. It's gonna have to release a larger amount of the heat before the temperature starts to decrease. That's another reason why you think about going to um, the beach in the summertime. When do you want to go to the beach in the summertime? In June or in August? Anybody know this answer? <laughs> Why do you want to go in August? Why would August be better than June? The water is warmer. Why? Because it's take, it takes like two months for the water to warm up. So, um, it, if you try to go to the beach in June, it's pretty cold. It's not very fun to, to try to go to the beach in June because the water isn't as warm. In August, it's much nicer and milder. The same is also true, like you can extend your beach vacations in some areas all the way through October because the water is still very warm and it's taking, it takes a couple of months to, you know, shift back down to being cold, you know, in the wintertime. So um, that's just another little added fun tidbit to know that if you're planning your beach vacations, you definitely don't want to do it too early in the summer. And even in the you know beginning of the fall is still a good time to go to the beach because the water is still remaining pretty warm at that point. Molar heat capacity, it's the same idea as specific heat, except for we're talking about it in terms of the mole of the substance per degree versus the gram of the substance per degree. The variables we use are C or CN. N, of course, usually denotes the variable for the mole. The units, of course, could be joules per mole degree Celsius, joules per mole K, kilojoules per mole K. You could use that as your energy unit as well. But you would see variations here, but the, the most notable part, of course, is mole is on the bottom rather than grams when we're talking about uh, measuring molar heat capacity. Quantifying heat. So heat capacity, we know, um, is really dependent on mass and the specific heat of the material. So from that, that idea, we are allowed to come up with a way of calculating how much heat we can put it into numbers now. It's not some um, abstract idea. You have the quantity of the substance, the mass, you know the specific heat of it, and you know the temperature change of it, then you will be able to, detail, to determine how much heat or, uh, was absorbed or released in that case. And in this particular set of um, examples, we're gonna look at it from the heating cooling standpoint. This is Q equals MCAT. Hopefully this will be a review from last year looking at Q equals MCAT. Uh, mass times specific heat times temperature change. This is the shortened version. Don't forget that temperature change is always the final minus the initial. As if you forget that, then sometimes you'll get the wrong sign if you don't subtract the right way and then you'll be your heat will be going the wrong direction so just pay attention to that the final minus the initial is how we do delta t so let's use that equation just for a regular idea like said making pasta 42 grams of water are heated from 15 to 30 Determine the heat absorbed in joules. All right, well, that's Q equals MCAT. Write out the formula, then you plug and chug. This is very uh, easy stuff. Like I said, this is more like Chem 1 stuff, but we're going to build upon it. So our specific heat of water from the table is 4.184 joules per grams degrees Celsius. I'm going to use that amount. So plugging and chugging, make sure you set it up. 
Our final temperature, though, happens to be the 30. We initially started at 15, so it's going to be 30 minus the 15. Setting it up to, writing it in, you can show the cancellation of the units. So the grams cancel with the grams, the degree Celsius cancels, and then we're left with our measure of heat, which happens to be joules here. And we do 42 times 4.184 times 15, and this gives us 2635.92. Now this one has three, the temperatures have three. These are measured values in here, so I'm gonna keep three. So I round to the three, round that up, so this would be 2640 joules. This is just a regular plug and chug. We're just adding, we're, we're heating up water. Pure and simple, that's all we're doing in this particular one. There's the nice clean version with all of the typed in numbers. Now let's look at the heating curve because that's basically what I was doing is I was heating water from 15 to 30. Well, that would be like here on the heating curve, which is 15 to what, about 30. So this would be kind of the segment I am for that previous problem doing it here on the heating curve. So obviously this is gonna be our liquid phase because I had liquid water that I was heating. And those slopes, of course, are representing A, C, and E, representing the different phases of matter. And they are on a heating curve, of course, the slopes are showing the temperature increasing. That's over here on the, the Y, and then the heat absorbed goes on the X. But as you're going up those uh, slopes, the temperature is increasing. If the temperature is increasing, what does that mean in terms of our kinetic energy of our particles? They are also increasing. So here the kinetic energy is increasing. Kinetic energy increasing. The kinetic energy is increasing at these particular segments. The potential energy is constant, okay, at these particular um, areas because right now the heat is being applied, it's making the particles move faster. So they're, um, even though in the solid, they're in fixed position and vibrating, but they start vibrating faster and faster and faster until they finally get to the plateau area here. When they finally reach that temperature, that is when they have enough energy to overcome the forces and start engaging in changing phase. So the plateaus are the phase changing parts of the graph. The slopes are just warming and making them move faster. So looking at our plateaus, the first one of course is the melting phase, going from solid to liquid. And the D plateau, in this case, this is of course representing water, this is zero degrees and 100 degrees, so this would be you know, showing the phases of water on the heating curve. But here, now your potential energy is increasing, starting to overcome forces and spread the particles out just a little bit. If you're going from solid to liquid, remember they're still pretty close together, but now the forces aren't so strong and they can flip and rotate and move and have more kinetic energy. But this plateau here, the temperature is not increasing, so the particles aren't really moving any faster at this point. Instead, that energy is going to, into overcoming the intermolecular forces. That's where, and that's why you don't see it in the uh, temperature there. Yes, go ahead. Correct. Yes, no, the, the kinetic energy here, yes, would be remaining constant. That is a good point because they're still all moving at the same average speed because they're all at zero degrees at that point. So up here, what you should notice, the difference between vaporization and melting, obviously the plateau is much larger 
for the for the vaporization going from the liquid to the gas. Why is that? Why is it such a huge, uh, larger plateau there? Why does it take more energy to vaporize than to melt? What do we assume about gases? in general from the kinetic molecular theory. True, they don't have volume, but in terms of what are we overcoming here when we're adding in the heat, they are really spaced apart. We also make the idea that yes, there are no forces, no intermolecular forces, no attractive or repulsive forces between the particles. So that idea when you vaporize you're overcoming all of the intermolecular forces, so there are none left at that point, because the assumption is the gas particles are in constant random motion, just bouncing off, no attractive, no repulsive, so no IMFs engaging at all. And that's why, obviously, it would take a lot more energy. I mean, there are molec intermolecular forces intact in the liquid, because they, would, they wouldn't stay so close together if there, if there weren't, so... So some of the energy goes into overcoming some of them so they are a little bit more free in movement. That's why their kinetic energy is greater, the liquid is, than the solid. But you don't completely overcome all of them until you go from liquid to gas. So I included this graphic as well because it also shows the cooling curve in comparison to the heating curve. And I know many people don't really go over the cooling curve. However, they can ask a cooling curve question. So the looking here at the graphic, all you see is really it's kind of like opposite. If you're cooling, you're releasing energy, kinetic energy is decreasing on the slopes, the potential energy is decreasing on the plateaus, uh, and so forth. So the positional energy here is kind of what we're thinking in terms of the position of the molecules. Um, they're staying in the same relative position. They're not spacing out from one another. So that's why the potential energies would be constant on the slopes. But during the phase changes, obviously, when the overcoming of the forces, um, if we're heating it or if you're condensing or freezing it, now you're reestablishing those forces. So you're changing the positions of the individual particles. So that's how I would look at the potential energy changes. Yes. Well, melting... In the melting process, they're not completely overcome. That's why the liquid particles are still very close in space together. They're just not as strong. So there are some of them, you know, that gives those particles free movement, and that's why liquids can flow. So the melting process overcomes some of them, so they're not in fixed positions and just vibrating like you would in a solid. But for but for boiling or, or evaporating or, I guess, vaporization is the better term because we're going from liquid to gas. In the kinetic molecular theory of gases, we are assuming that there are no forces left. They are all gone. Uh, Correct. But that, that basically sublimation skips the whole liquid phase. So you would really, if you're looking at this, if I was looking at a heating curve with just sublimation on it, it would be like this. It would just have the one plateau, and this would be the solid, this would be the gas, and this would be the phase change. So there wouldn't, there, I was going to say, there wouldn't be an intermittent, intermittent um, liquid phase in there. All right, so I threw in these graphics just as a quick review of phases of matter, if anybody's forgotten them from Unit 3 or needs a little brush up here. Once again, solids are packed, vibrating, definite shape volume. Liquids closely packed but able to flow, have more free movement, so they have the definite volume but indefinite shape. And then gases, they have no forces. They're supposed to be in constant random motion, bouncing off the walls of their container. Uh, just a few other things here, like showing the phase changes, 
and the spacing of the particles for those in you know particulate model diagrams okay so so keep that in mind as you're looking at our graphics here just reviewing a little bit because now we're going to get into the heat changes of phase you know the heat involved when we're phase changing molar heat of vaporization is delta h vape that's how it looks the amount of heat needed to change one mole of a substance from a liquid to a gas. Now, delta H vape is also the same magnitude as the one used for condensation. It's only that it would be the negative value because the heat is being released rather than absorbed. So you would employ the negative sign to show the direction. However, the, the amount to, to vaporize would be the same amount to condense. It's just the different direction in which the energy is flowing. Um, and it's for one mole, same idea as it would be for uh, vaporizing process. Molar heat of fusion deals with, of course, melting. The amount needed to change one mole of the substance from a solid to a liquid. Heat of fusion works the same way as vaporization. If we're talking about freezing or solidification, crystallizing, you would just use the same magnitude number except for it would be the other sign, the other direction, because we would be saying when you are freezing, you would be um, releasing energy rather than absorbing it. And that would be an exothermic process rather than endo. Melting would be endo, you're adding in heat. The freezing would be exo, where it's releasing heat. Same magnitude number, though. For these problems, you need the chart, and they usually give you it to give it to you in a chart like such, or they'll actually just write it in the problem. But sometimes they give you the extra data, so you have to pick out the right number to use, depending upon the phase change. So don't get that you know messed up. If it's talking about vaporization, you want the delta H vape number. If they're talking about uh, melting or freezing, then you want the heat of fusion number. But they'll usually, you know, they don't expect you to have these numbers memorized, so they'll be somewhere in the problem. Now, the basic idea here is most of the time they give you the, the sample in grams. However, these values are in kilojoules per mole, just like any other delta H value would be written. So what you have to do is change it to moles. So moles times the heat of vaporization will give you the heat needed to go you know, from uh, the liquid to the gas. The moles times the heat of fusion would give you the ones to go from the solid to the liquid and so forth. But most of the times they give you grams to start with rather than moles, so you have to do that extra conversion step. So let's do a problem with this. Change the grams to moles, use the correct delta H from the chart. So here, calculate the amount of heat released when 244 grams of ammonia is frozen. So we're taking that sample, we're freezing it, we want to know how much heat is going to be released in that process. Well, I do need to look here on my chart, figure out which one I'm dealing with. Well, here's ammonia down here in the last row. Which value do I need to work this problem? We're freezing it, right? So freezing goes with which one? The fusion. So we would want the 5.66, correct. Because we're freezing, so which is the opposite of the melting. The only thing is that the heat's being released rather than absorbed there. So I would set it up. I would do the 244 grams here. This is ammonia, so NH3. Change that to moles, so grams of ammonia. That's 17.04 equals one mole. All right, now, because we know it's the 5.66 kilojoules, this is per one mole. This becomes a conversion factor for us, and we can use it in our T-charts. So for every uh, 5.66 kilojoules, that's going to equate to one mole. So I can take my mole and diagonal it down here. So put the moles down here of ammonia, and I can put the kilojoules on the top. And then I just insert my numbers, 5.66 equals one mole. 
Now that all of my labels are set up, I can check my work and cancel. So that's a good way to check. Grams cancel with grams. That's good. They're gone. Moles cancel with moles. And I am left with the heat, which is what I want. And then I do the multiplication and division. 244 times 5.66 divided by 17.04. And I get 81 or 81.0 kilojoules. And this is, you could say, released. Or if you wanted to, you could stick the negative sign in there and then put negative 81 kilojoules, which is also telling you that it's released. It's exothermic. It's leaving the system. Here's the more cleaned up version. I definitely should have wrote the word released here. Um, or like I said before, you could put in the negative 81 kilojoules. That would also be acceptable. That's one way of doing the phase changes. The other way that they could give it to you looks like this, where they're giving you the energy and they want you to tell me what the sample size is. So calculate the grams of liquid ethanol that would vaporize into a gas when 5,980 kilojoules of heat are absorbed. So we're starting with the energy and now we're working backward to the grams. Could ask you something like this as well. But once again, we need our chart here. So which value am I looking for for ethanol? Ethanol's the second row. Which one would I need to work this problem? Yes, definitely the vaporization because it says vaporize to a gas. So are going from liquid to gas. We want the 38.6 kilojoules per mole. Exactly right. So now my initial starting point of my t-chart happens to be the 5,980 kilojoules. So that's what I start off with. So in order to get rid of the kilojoules, I have to put them down here. So now I would go to moles. That's the thing I would go to because this is my conversion factor. Well, you have to, you, would, you could do the equation to find the moles, but then you're gonna have to convert it anyways at the end. So it's much easier to just set it all up in one calculation, in my opinion. So here the one mole goes on the top, this is ethanol, of course, so this is the C2H5OH. And that then the 38.6, this needs to go on the bottom next to the kilojoules here. So once we're there, we can continue on because we want to eventually get to grams. So one mole of ethanol happens to be 46.08 grams of ethanol. Since we've done all those ethanol problems in our redox post lab, have that molar mass memorized now. So now we can make sure that our dimensions are set up correctly and we are canceling appropriately. Kilojoules cancel with kilojoules, moles cancel with moles, and yes, we are left with the grams, which is what we want. And I get 1,000 or 7,140 kilojoules. That's being absorbed. No, not kilojoules, grams. Need to read my unit better. Grams here. So grams of ethanol. And this is the one that's the trickiest because you're like, oh, they gave me energy and I have no idea what to do with it. Well, if you're phase changing, you have heat of vaporization or fusion, you can always switch to moles. And from there, you can always find grams and other things, liters, particles, whatever. Now, using our heating curve and working a problem that really actually takes you through a heating curve and it's a nice helpful visual aid uh, when you have to work one of these problems. So 
kind of going idea across the heating curve how we would work it. For instance, starting with A, if we needed to calculate something that's in the warming category, so it's going to be a Q equals MCAT kind of problem. You're not phase changing, you're just heating up the temperature there. So you have a certain amount that's being heated at a certain specific heat and you do the temperature change and you can find out how much heat was absorbed there. Going along B here, phase changing, we want to use the phase change idea, which once again, I set up as a T-chart because usually they give you grams, but then you can use the heat of fusion as a conversion factor and finish the calculation that way. But melting is gonna involve the moles times the heat of fusion. But like I said, most of the time they give you the substance in grams, so you have to start with that um, at the beginning of your calculation. C is back to warming a phase. In that case, it's warming the liquid. So that would involve another Q equals MCAT. You're just changing the temperature, raising the temperature, warming it, increasing its kinetic energy. Then, of course, the vaporization, now that's a phase change, so we're rotating back to going along with Q equals the moles times the vaporization. Once again, they usually start with grams, change it to moles, and then you can multiply. And last but not least, if they want you to all work it all the way up to the gas to a certain temperature and it warms the gas, you would have to do an additional Q equals MCAT at that point. Now the example problem I have you doing is only going to work through three of the, the heating curve, although I have seen different problems where they make you start at like negative 50 and have you go to 120 degrees. And all the steps in between, you have to add up all the different heat values of each step in order to get the total heat needed to change that substance to have it go from solid all the way to gas to at a certain temperature. Let's look at my example here, this exercise four. We're gonna take a piece of ice. We're going to take the piece of ice that's at negative 11. We're gonna heat it until it gets uh, changes to liquid water and is heated to 49.5 degrees Celsius. So if they don't give you the heating curve here, it's a good thing to draw one so you can kind of get your mental picture of where you're starting at, where you're going. So we're starting down here at like negative 11, which is about right here in the solid range. We're going all the way up here to the liquid right about there, about 49.5 degrees Celsius. And here's the negative 11 degrees Celsius. We have to add up all the heat needed to get all the way up to here. Well, we're going to have to warm the solid until we get to the melting point right here. Warm the solid to get to that melting point. Then we're going to have to melt it. Then we're going to have to warm the liquid or the water at this point up to the 49.5 degrees. So this particular calculation involves three different energy amounts that we have to individually calculate. Then we can add them up at the end. So this first step, I've got to heat it till I get to the melting point. I gotta warm it up to the melting point or it's not gonna melt, so I gotta do that first. So the first step, of course, is a Q equals MCAT. We're gonna start there and we're gonna warm that. Once again, they have to give you this data. You are not expected to know that off the top of your head. So they usually give you the fusion, the vaporization, and then the specific heats of all of the different phases of the matter. Q equals MCAT. First starting off point, we have 23 grams. So we would use that 23 grams there. The specific heat of Ice happens to be a different value. It's 2.078, so we would put that in here. Joules per grams degrees Celsius, and then the temperature change. Starting at negative 11, that's my Ti. My final temperature, though, to get it up to melting stage is going to be zero. So this is going to be zero minus the 11 degrees as you can see there.
And this is where we can easily get our um, negative signs. It's T final minus T initial for that delta T. So this, of course, changes to plus plus. Then we do our calculation. And I believe we get 525.7 joules here. Now that's the first step. That's how much heat it took to get it from negative 11 to zero degrees Celsius. The second step here is going to involve melting it. So now we're gonna go across the plateau. We're gonna melt it. So this is where we need to do the moles times the heat of fusion. We don't know the moles, of course, because we're starting with this 23 gram sample. So we're gonna use that. To start with, 23 grams of our ice. Now, uh, hopefully we all remember that the molar mass of H2O happens to be 1802, that equals one mole. Okay, and now we're melting it. So I look down here and I want my heat of fusion number because I'm melting. So I'm gonna use the 6.01, so one mole of the melting ice gives me 6.01 kilojoules. So then I can calculate this, I end up getting what? 7.671 kilojoules. So that's the second amount of heat that was applied. Now we're over here, it's all melted at zero degrees. So we have cold water, very, very cold water. The last step, that we have to consider is getting it warm, warming it up here to this point, getting it up to that 49.50 degrees Celsius. So now we're back in Q equals MCAT territory, but it's in liquid form, so we have to use our liquid specific heat. This is the third step here. So Q equals MCAT. The mass is still 23, that's easy. In this case now it's 4.184 joules per grams degree Celsius. Now, the initial and final temperatures, let's think about this. At this point we're starting at zero degrees Celsius, so that becomes Ti. At the end we're ending at 49.5, so that's our Tf. So working, our, working ourselves up the curve, except for I put 45, it should be 49 here. All right, minus the zero degrees Celsius. Then we do this and we end up getting our heat where we're warming it from zero, we're making it not so cold water anymore. And we get four, seven, six, three joules. Everything up here has four digits, so that's why I carried everything out to four digits. Now that we have the heat amounts that it took to go through each part of the curve, that heating curve to get us from negative 11 all the way up here to the 49.5, yes, we have to add them, but notice there is a little bit of a glitch to this. What's the problem? have one measurement in kilojoules and the other two are in joules. Now it doesn't designate which one you're supposed to go to. I always change the joules to kilojoules. So um, you don't have to do that, but you can. So I would make this to, to you would divide by a thousand point two five uh, five two five seven here. That would be the kilojoules there. This one would be 4.763 divided by 1,000. Oh, that's kilojoules now. So now we could add all of them up. And we add all of them up, uh, 0 0.5257. You could always go the joule route if you prefer to do that. You would multiply this one by 1,000 if you wanted to go the joule route. Uh, it really doesn't matter because they didn't tell us what they wanted it in, so it's up to you to decide. So we add all of these up and then we end up 
um, getting, oh, there's a missing the jewels here, looking at place value, because in addition and subtraction for sig figs, we want to look at place value. This one goes out four, this one goes out three, this one goes out three, so we would add that up there. Now I think it ends up getting to be like 12.5, no, let me, let me add it up because I don't remember the number off the top of my head. 0.5257 plus 0.671 plus, uh, that's nine, see it's a nine five. Nine seven. So this becomes a rounding fun one. Round that up, round that up. So we get 12.960 kilojoules. If you did it in the joules, you would end up being 12,960 joules because you would just multiply this by a thousand. So either or is fine, but just pay attention if they designate whether it should be in kilojoules or joules you, that you'd go to the right the right uh, particular unit there. But yeah, these are very long problems. Most of the time I've seen them be more like two steps. Like have you uh, warm it and then have you melt it or they have you warm it and then vaporize it. Not necessarily doing three steps um, in an AP problem. So keep that in mind. So here's the cleaned up version. You can look back at it in more detail. And then add the adding process, convert kilojoules to, convert to kilojoules, or you could have gone the other way and converted to joules, and then you just add all three up to get that final value. Calorimetry. Technique used to measure the amount of heat. This is in the laboratory setting. This is a uh, lab technique. You can do it for chemical things where there's actually reactions or physical process like dissolution. Other things like that um, can also be done in this particular kind of setting. Now in our lab, of course, we would have used the coffee cup calorimeter idea, which are basically styrofoam cups, as you see here, a stacking of them. It's good insulated material, though not completely perfect, but this is what we would use, obviously, for our high school lab. In more complicated, or I would say in, in better labs, they usually have the bomb calorimeters, which are a more complicated type of device that is probably uh, better insulated and does a better, um, a more accurate measure of the heat exchange. The thing that you have to remember here is you see the thermometer sticking through the, the styrofoam cup, and that's what we would have done too if, if we were able to do the hand warmer lab. Um, but the thermometer is always representing the surroundings perspective. So if the temperature goes up and your goes from a lower to a higher temperature, that means the surroundings are getting warmer. So think about that in terms of the sign, because you want to be thinking about it from the system perspective, but we measure it from the surroundings. The opposite is also true. If the temperature decreases on the thermometer, that means the surroundings is getting colder and the system is getting warmer. So that means it's absorbing energy. Keep, keep that in mind too, that it's an opposite perspective based off of the way the, the, the temperature goes on the thermometer. Now, thermal energy transfer. We know it flows from the warmer object to the colder object. We already kind of talked about that. That's how the heat flows from the higher temperature material to the lower temperature material. And that amount of flow is equal. So what is lost by the one is gained by the other. So the hot material loses, the cold material gains. Same magnitude amount of heat. So here, the Q system equals the negative Q surroundings. That is, if the system was gaining and the surroundings was losing, it would be the opposite. If you had negative Q system would equal Q surroundings, that would mean that the system is losing and the surroundings is gaining. So when the temperature of both materials is equal, the thermal equilibrium has been reached. Thermal equilibrium, of course, if you take the colder and hotter objects, eventually it stabilizes and makes, you know, everything now equals just the one temperature. At that particular point, when everything now equals the same temperature, 
goes back to the same concept of before. If it's at the same temperature, it has the same average kinetic energy of the particles. So that applied to gases, it applies here too. If it's at the same temperature, it is assumed to have the same average kinetic energy of the particles. In this particular example of the picture here, we're showing a, the metal being dropped into the water. Now, I can surmise that the water is the hot of the, of the pair and the metal is the cold of the pair because there's the negative sign in front of the water. So the heat is being lost from the water and being gained by the metal and they're colliding and whatever with each other until they reach that thermal equilibrium and reach that one temperature for both substances. But that would be kind of thing here. And there are problems, and you'll see one, where you take a hot metal and drop it in water, and then you want to calculate the different variables of uh, depending on which variable you're looking for. That is one you know, method of uh, doing a calorimetry problem. Some of the other ones, of course, involve the reaction process. But in that case, that would just be the metal and the water interacting and transferring heat. This is where we use these, you know, this Q equals MCAT equation again, but we're going to kind of use it differently here. And the instance that we just talked about would be like the mass of the object, where the metal is being dropped in, and then you have your mass of your water. But if we're talking about like taking salt and dissolving it into solution, that would be here the mass of solution. You would have to consider all of the mass of the entire solution to get the heat change. So you're taking three grams of salt, putting it in 40 grams of water. Well, that now is 43 grams of solution that has been mixed. So keep that in mind. The, all of the um, variables are the same as before. We're just going to use it slightly differently. When your food is cooling down and there's steam, does that mean that the food is transferring heat in the form of steam to the surroundings? Yes, I guess. Um, if you were to put your hand like over the top of your food there, not touching it, but you would probably feel the heat coming off of the food. So yeah, in that particular way, I guess I would think of it that way. Now for the mole equation. It's not very frequent that I see them using moles in the problems. Every once in a while though, I see a mole problem and you're supposed to know how to use it. So. The only real difference is here is the specific heat is molar heat capacity. And like before, it's usually in joules per moles degree Celsius or joules per mole K there. And then, of course, the N is referring to the mole amount. And we're going to be able to use the Q equals MCAT and the Q equals NCAT equations interchangeably as we're comparing heat transferring between substances. So same kind of idea here, uh, except for instead of mass measurements, we're using mole measurements in for the variables. Now this is where it gets fun, okay? We have the Q surroundings and the Q system. And any of these equations down here, any of them can equal either Q at any point. So, um, if they gave you like measurements of say a metal that we would call it like the the system and then the water it's being dropped in is the surroundings but they gave you the metal in terms of the mole data and they gave you the surroundings of the water in gram data well then you would have to use something like this where you're using the mole data equaling the gram data of the two various substances Usually it's mass to mass, or usually it's moles to mole, but you can use any of these equations interchangeably because the measurement of the heat, remember gained, is still going to be the measurement of the heat lost. It's just the opposite sign. And both of these equations equal that Q value, that heat measurement. So you can set them equal to each other if we have you know, two things that are transferring heat from one another. And let's look at a couple of examples, like this one. 
we're taking a 100 gram sample of water at 90. And so we basically have two cups of water here. We have one that's at 90, one that's at 10. They're both 100 grams and we're dumping them together. What would be the final temperature? This is what you want to imagine. I'm gonna call this one water one and this one water two, all right? So obviously this one's at 90, this one's at 10. Which one's gonna lose heat? Which one's gonna gain heat? Yes, this one's gonna lose. Okay, so this one gets the negative, this one's gonna gain. So this one's gonna get the positive, all right? So water one loses, we know because it's at the higher temperature, so it's obviously gonna lose heat when it's mixed with something colder. So if you think, you don't have to like understand, um, like you don't have to like actually do the math here to get the answer because to me, yes, it's pretty obvious. It's the same amount. The temperature should just fall directly in the middle. But if you cannot visually see that, then look at the equations, okay? So we have grams, grams, so that's m cat, okay, is gonna equal m cat. This is water one, so then this is gonna be negative because it's losing. This would be water two. This is gonna be positive because it's gaining. What variables could we cross out immediately here? that we, we definitely wouldn't need to factor in. The mass and the specific heat, because the specific heat of water is the same. And since we both have 100 grams each, the masses would be the same. So we could cancel those out and not even factor them into our calculation. So let's do that. So here, then we have the negative outside, the change in temperature. So our final temperature minus the initial temperature here is 90 degrees. Over here, we have the plus in front. I like to use the signs to make sure I don't get my signs messed up. So the final temperature uh, minus the 10. And if you do the math real quick, what you'll notice is it ends up being 2TF equal to 100. So what is TF then? It's going to be 50 degrees. So yes, the answer would be B there. No, if the phases were different, we would not be able to cancel out the C's because they are different values, like the ice was 2.01 or 2.03, can't remember what it was, but um, the water is 4.184. So in the different phases, they do have different specific heats. So if, if you were doing two of the same substance at different phases, you would not be able to cancel out the C, that is correct particular case though, we know that they're both liquids because um, the melting point is zero and the boiling point is 100, so they're both in the liquid phase at this point, making that assumption, okay? So that's one example. And yes, it would be B. Exercise six is similar. However, there is a little bit, one little altered factor. What's the altered factor here? The math is different. And yeah, you should kind of be able to eyeball it and be like, okay, 100 at 90 and 500 at 10. Where would it fall? Where would the temperature fall? It's going to be between 10 and 50, right? Because you have more of the colder and less of the hotter. So obviously it's going to go towards the colder side, closer to the 10. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly right. You could You could just do the uh, eyeballing there and answer the multiple choice question. However, then they ask us to calculate the final temperature. And that's where you want to set up your, once again, we'll make this water one, this water two. This one's losing, so that's the negative Q. This one's the gaining of the Q. But the MCATs both equal Q, so you would just do water one, negative M delta, you know, delta T. Over here, the positive for the water two. M, C, delta T. Uh, we would be able to cancel out our specific heat still because they're both liquid water. You would just now have to factor in the masses. So this one would be 100. Um, 
I guess what um, times the temperature change. So this would be Tf minus 90. And over here, this would be 500 times the Tf minus 10. Then you have to distribute, so you get negative 100 Tf, uh, what, plus 9,000, is that right? And then over here, this would be 500 Tf minus 5,000. Huh, so then we end up with, what, 600 Tf over here, if I add that to both sides and subtract or add this one to both sides, so this would be 14,000. Just moving this variable over here, that variable over to that side. Divide those two and then your final temperature, I think it comes out to being like 23.333. These both have two, so I would just make it have two, so it would be 23 degrees Celsius would be the exact final temperature that we would record.